Please call to order. I am recording with you, uh, call to order. Mayor Studebaker? Here. Councilor Kohlhoff? Here. Ma'am? Here. O'Neill? Here. Lamont? Here. Wynn? Here. Wendland? Here. Would you stand and join me in the flag salute, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Before we get started, I have the honor of introducing to you our new city manager, this is Martha Bennett. Martha, okay. stand up and... Stand up. I know our first item of business is citizen comment. Daryl Bloom. Daryl Bloom, yeah, come on up, Daryl. Oh, <laughs> well, we've been seeing you watching, watching you before the meeting. Yeah, I had a nice uh, letter to the editor written up, and I couldn't find it, so I'm scrambling to get the context of it for you. But it's been a busy day for me. Uh, basically, I, I'm just trying to implore you not to put the a center, Parks and Rec Center, on the edge of town. Center, put it in the center of town where people can get at it. You know, like we talked about the North Acre Project, and that'd be a nice area to put the center at for activities, et cetera. As far as uh, facilities for offices and everything, you can still put plenty of that out at the golf course because uh, there's pl plenty of room. As we know, we got a lot of that stuff going out there now. And to actually just run the golf course takes one person at a terminal. It's just not a big labor-intensive uh, job. And we had this forum where the, the, we sat and gave ideas, uh, you know, what we wanted to do. And uh, there's a website off on Parks and Rec that Nancy Hamilton put up. Um, and there were some comments on that, that people had made. I went through all those comments. Nobody ever commented, said, you know, boy, putting a $17 million rec center out at the golf course, boy, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm on board with that. Not at all. Here's what it said. Uh, for example, I, I don't think we should build a rec center. We failed with the other building. For a pool, let's work with the school. That's one person. Further on, new community center for classes, exercise classes. Please put it in a central location, not at the golf course. We really don't need a dedicated community center. <clears throat> Another comment, I would like to see drainage improvements on the existing golf course have no interest in using a course less than 18 holes. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, another one, Parks and Rec needs a permanent home for its programming uh, comment. The golf course with some improvements such as drainage works well for the community. It has been called a gem by many. I do not think we should change it to a nine hole course. I think Parks and Rec facility would be better placed in another location. So far I've not had one person I've talked to about this that wants to change the golf course so listen to the people who use the course. And just a couple more comments. Uh, pool, uh, they talk about the pool. Also a community center would be invaluable. We need a central location for classes. These are four or five comments from people that attended this. And finally one more, if you do, if you do not build a new rec center, or if you do, if you do build a new rec center, please locate it in a central location so all residents can enjoy it, not out by the golf course, which appeals to only a few residents. Location, location, location. And these are not my comments. These are from, from the seminars that we had. I forget. This is, we had three of them throughout the city. So, And then I was trying to write a summary, but, <laughs> but I got called up too early. Basically, what I'm thinking is we should not spend $17 million on a parks and rec center and another $3 million on a golf course. And I wonder how many people would have voted for that $30 million bond if it said, we need $30 million, and by, for that we're going to build $17 million park and rec center and, and $3 million more on the golf course. I don't think many people would have gone along with that. So should we spend that kind of money? I, I say not. I say put the headquarters in a general location where people who use it can, can get, uh, get to it conveniently. The, 
the Anchor Project would be a great place for it. You've got downtown stores, the restaurants and everything. It'd be really a good focal point for the community. And then one final point, uh, I play golf on uh, uh, almost every day. That's where my face got screwed up. I went looking for golf balls where I shouldn't have been. Ran into some blackberries, but traffic is a real problem out there. And uh, if you do put it out there, obviously you're going to have to put some new stop signs, et cetera, in there. But um, I would like to make some, just have you improve the course with the drainage issues and find a central location for the Parks and Recs HQ. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Heidi Scrimson. Heidi Scrimshire, 13880, <clears throat> excuse me, Noss Road. And I am speaking as a citizen, not as a member of the Parks Board. But I am talking about the um, pool in the rec center. Um, we are lucky enough to be facing a once in a lifetime opportunity to capitalize on both the school and park bonds to build pools and a rec center for our community. Um, and Robolod. Uh, one of our newest park boards members was unable to attend tonight, but she has many years of experience working for the Seattle YMCA. She stated to me that the Y would never put a pool and a rec, rec center located in two different locations. It makes no sense. They should be co-located to save on FTEs, and it makes sense, um, it makes it easier for our citizens. For example, if a child is having a swim lesson, the parent can go and work out in the rec center. So it is a, a more of a convenience for our um, citizens. The school district is in the business of educating our children. They should not be in charge of running our pool. That should be the job of the LO Parks Department. Uh, the citizens have made it very clear that they want a pool and a rec center. We need to look at the most cost effective way to work together to build both a cold and warm water pool as part of an overall rec center. Feasibility studies show that they will fit on the golf course. Yes, it is very tight, but sadly, the West End building, which had lots of land, is no longer in our possession. The Sturgeon development um, of the North Anchor block recent, blocks recently fell through. Is it feasible to place them there? Two stories could go towards Parks and Rec, and two stories could um, go for condos to offset the cost. There's talk about spending a lot of money renovating the Adult Community Center. Why don't we sell this high value property where the ACC is located and use those funds to go towards a community rec center? Baby boomers do not want to be isolated. Studies show that they want to be connected with community, not off on their own. I fear that even if we renovate the ACC, membership will continue to decline and will no longer be relevant. The clock is ticking. We can no longer kick the can down the road. We need strong leadership from both city council members and school board members. This is your time to leave a legacy for citizens of Lake Oswego. I urge you all to step up and come up with a solution together that is best for our great city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Sam Stites. <clears throat> Are we on the record? <laughs> Uh, good evening, Council. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you all together, um, I have taken a new position within our company. Starting September 16th, I will be covering the state legislature for uh, Pamela Media Group's Capitol Bureau, which is a uh, collaboration between the Salem Reporter, Eastern Oregonian, and the Portland Tribune. A uh, huge step forward for me in my career, but it wouldn't have been possible without this job. Um, and you have all made this an incredible experience, um, you know, maybe not always on the same page, or uh, you know, maybe we you didn't like something that I wrote, but you've always been incredibly, <laughs> incredibly nice to me, um, despite you know maybe uh, you know being at odds. Uh, I really appreciate everything that you have uh, helped me with, and I hope to you know not be strangers in the future. But thank I just wanted you. to say thank you for Congratulations. yeah thank you Congrats. appreciate it. yeah you're a good writer and a good yeah writer. I brought tonight I have with me uh, my replacement this is Clara Howell she was covering the Westland Wilsonville School District most recently and she'll be stepping into the role here in the middle of the month well welcome yeah. <laughs> Sam. 
we loved uh, Anthony Manouk. We didn't know whether you were going to be any good. <laughs> and in no time, you were great. So I don't know who you stepped on whose toes, but it was, certainly wasn't anybody that I've ever talked to. So okay. I do wish you the best. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hopefully this is going to continue. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you deserve the job, I think. I mean, you're going to be reporting on politics 24-7, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Are it's you going... sure that's a promotion? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe hazardous duty. Pay. Yeah, yeah. I'll have a lot more dealing with Rob. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Joel Tyner. Hello, so um, my name is Joel Tyner. I'm at 2251 Fernwood Circle here in Lake Oswego. Just moved here in March. Um, my wife, uh, Layla, was raised here. Um, basically lived just about my whole life in New York. We just had a, uh, about three and a half months ago, we had a beautiful baby girl named Sequoia, and so we're raising a family here. Um, I sent uh, you folks an email this morning. Uh, uh, I know one of you seem to be positive about it. Uh, I'm not expecting or asking necessarily uh, for you to sign a letter tonight saying, we're going to make the city of Lake Oswego 100% fossil fuel free by 2030, or 2035, or 2050. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking you to consider at some point in the next week or two, in the next month or two, is to sign a letter saying that you agree with uh, Senators Merkley and Wyden and representatives of Blumenauer and DeFazio and Bonamici, that you agree with them, forget about Lake Oswego for the moment, that you agree with them in their support, because they are all co-sponsors of the Green New Deal legislation, Ed Markey, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, both senators from this state and those three members of the House of Representatives are all strong co-sponsors of the Green New Deal for a just, prosperous, and sustainable economy. I'm 55. Hopefully, I'll have a few decades left on this planet. Um, Scientific American reported a month or two or three ago, echoed by Democracy Now!, there's only 60 harvests left. Kind of breaks my heart to look at my three month old daughter say, hey, you know, we're literally going to hell in a handbasket. Listening to Democracy Now! this morning on KBU, God knows how many, what, four or five different Category 5 hurricanes hitting in the last few years. Um, I remember the uh, 1974 OPEC oil embargo. Hopefully you guys do as well. Remember that? We're all going to go, you know, renewable, green energy, energy efficiency, conservation. We're going to do solar, wind. That was, huh, that was 19, what, 74? That was, what, 45 years ago? I've had it. I'm here for myself. I'm here for my wife. I'm here for my kid. Um, I'm not pushing or expecting or asking you tonight to do what Portland did um, over the last year or two and decide, you know, 100% renewable electricity by 2035 and everything renewable by 2050. I'm not asking tonight for you to do what the Republican mayor of Georgetown, Texas did two years ago, 100% renewable there. I'm not asking for you to do what the Republican mayor of San Diego, Kevin Faulkner, working with the Chamber of Commerce there three years ago. 100% renewable by 2035, that's their goal. I may be coming back here. I was active on the East Coast. I'm asking you to consider just merely stating publicly at some point in the next week or two, month or two, that you stand by and you support the two senators and Bonamici and Blumenauer and DeFazio for the Green New Deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Any other? Okay. Next thing on, uh, or is there any follow-up? Ms. Bennett, any follow-up from prior comments? No. <laughs> that was Not yet. <laughs> How's that test, right? How'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> really well. Okay. Next, uh, Youth Leadership Council Review and Proposal.
Hello. Oh, can, is this on? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm Jenny Slepian, the Youth Leadership Council staff liaison, and I brought two Youth Leadership Council members with me who can introduce themselves. <laughs> um, I'm Meta Bakarjola. I'm new this year to the Youth Leadership Council. I'm Ellie Tanamira. I am also new this year to the Youth Leadership Council. Um, so we are here uh, because this felt like a good time. This is our fourth year with the Youth Leadership Council, and most of our original batch graduated this past year, and so we have five new members, which is about half. Um, so it felt like a good time to consider making some changes to how the council is run. Um, so as you may remember, uh, the Youth Leadership Council was formed by Resolution 1637 in 2016 with a very broad and fairly ambiguous mission for us to work through what we wanted this council to be. And that's basically what we've been doing for the past few years. Um, I have been the staff liaison since its inception. I sat on the original interview, <laughs> so I feel like I've seen it go through the waves it's gone through over the past few years. Um, currently, we have 11 members. Originally, we, we had 10, but we have had so much interest in recruitment over the past few years that it got really hard to say no. So, for example, this year we had five open spaces and we had 26 applicants for those spaces, which is great. Um, so maybe it will grow larger. I don't know. 11 for one person is a little bit like herding cats, but <laughs> it's been going okay. Um, Currently, we meet monthly with meetings that alternate between council chambers and the main fire station. Um, they sort of alternate between being work sessions for them to work on their own projects and then for them to learn about the city. So we've had, um, I think, three or four attempts for people from fire to come and talk to us and every time they go out on a call. So we ended up just having a meeting at the Westlake Fire Station in the Bay so that they could do it as quickly as possible before they inevitably went out on a call. Uh, we've been to the water treatment plant. We've had Dale Jorgensen and before that, Don Johnson come and talk to us. Megan Phelan and Scott Lazenby have come and spoken to them. So really, we've tried to give them some sort of an introduction into how the city is run and a window into operations that youth don't normally get an opportunity to see. Um, we have had our youth leadership councils attend city council meetings in the past, but this was uh, shocking to a lot of us. They have never actually met all of you um, in the four years since their inception, so that is one of the things that we would like to change. Um, while they've been to city council <coughs> meetings, they have developed interests that have been surprising to me. So they listen to public comment, they listen to what's on the agenda, and they've been fascinated by the tree discussions that have happened over the past few years. They've been fascinated by uh, conversations about development overall and roads and traffic because teenagers like to get around. Um, <laughs> so these, these issues, and of course, the swimming pool and the rec center often come up, and they did write a letter about this a few years ago. So um, part of what they have also done is a lot of outreach. So the LO Speaks event, which is a TED Talk style event they've done for the past two years and has been pretty successful. Um, they have helped me <laughs> with Shred Day and Community Cleanup Day, which we have turned into fundraising events, um, mostly for suicide outreach organizations, one called To Write Love on Her Arms, and then most recently Lines for Life. Um, two years ago, we went to the National League of Cities conference, so Joe Buck and I and Jackie and Teresa, uh, we went with four Youth Leadership Council members, and they had a great time. They met Cory Booker, they met all sorts of interesting people, and it was really a valuable experience for them. They also participate in the Oregon Youth Summit, which is um, an event that's just for youth councils around the state, and it's held down in Salem every year. Despite doing all of this, um, We've still been trying to figure out what we want our mission and our focus to be. And over the past couple years, um, especially last year, we started to have some issues with attendance and reliability and communication. Um, you know, typical youth issues. They're very busy. We pick the cream of the crop for this one, or they pick the cream of the crop because they do their own recruitment. Um, and so it felt like it was time to sort of focus on how we could make this 
youth council have a little bit more accountability and a stronger focus so that they know at the beginning of the year what it is they're going to be doing, what is expected of them, and what the focus will be for that year instead of, in all honesty, the staff liaison sitting there a week before the meeting going, I have to put out an agenda. What are we going to do? Because it's not an effective way to run meetings or to run a council. So the, there are six areas where I have proposed changes. Um, the first, as I mentioned, is a schedule. So I did Leadership Lake Oswego, which I thought was an amazing program. And so I thought that uh, running the youth council more like leadership, where you get a schedule at the beginning of the year and every month has a different focus, would be a, a good model for this. So for example, uh, we'll have a meeting. They'll get to know each other this month. And then in October, we'll go to the water treatment plant. <laughs> uh, we'll do a tour of LOCOM. And we'll build in those work sessions. And they have that schedule at the beginning of the year so they can see how the year is going to be modeled, which I think would be new and will help them balance their schedules better. We've also not had an annual service requirement. So the Youth Action Council has a requirement that they serve 30 hours. And that's a combination of meetings, events, activities. Um, we've been very, like, <coughs> When we recruit, we say, eh, it could be five hours a month, it could be 10, maybe two, I don't know. And it makes it very hard for busy students to balance their schedules with that kind of ambiguity. So I am proposing a 30 hour a year uh, service requirement. <coughs> I am also proposing to be a little bit more strict with attendance. So we have allowed them to write their own bylaws. Um, and in the bylaws, it says that they are not allowed to miss more than two meetings. And I have never enforced that. I would like to start enforcing that. So the Youth Action Council, um, after two excused absences, Sid Fletcher will ask them to step down. Um, it does give them an opportunity to commit a little bit more strongly to showing up. Uh, only one unexcused absence is allowed, and I would like to do the same. Um, we have been saying in the past that if they miss a meeting, they come to a city council meeting or a board or commission meeting to make it up. And that's fine, but ultimately, we need everybody to be there. Um, it, that falls into accountability as well. So as you can see in attachment two of the staff report, there is an accountability form that I've asked them, that I will be asking them all to sign, uh, saying that they will show up, that they will present themselves as representatives of the city, um, that they will behave in ways that meet their bylaws, which means that they're tolerant towards each other and others, et cetera, that they will show up and meet the 30 hour year requirement. Um, we have also been appointing them to two-year terms, which essentially just kind of roll over so they apply once and never apply again. But uh, we'd like to do what the YAC does, which is reapply every year, so that you're making that commitment to stay on this council year after year and that you have the opportunity, so that each one of those students has the opportunity in June to think about whether they would like to continue this for the next year. Because we did have some pretty mean senioritis last year. And I don't think that was effective or fun for any of them. So uh, the biggest question that I have for you is funding. So we uh, very much enjoyed our trip to the National League of Cities Conference. Um, Happy Valley, Beaverton, Tigard, Forest Grove, all of those youth councils go. Um, we would like to go every other year instead of every year and take a maximum of five students with us. Um, when we did go, we tried to fundraise for it because we don't want cost of the trip to be a barrier for whether a student decides whether they could go or not. It sort of worked out and it was incredibly distracting. So instead of focusing on learning about city operations and city government, they were spending all their time figuring out how to raise money. So my ask of you is to fund and um, every other year trip to DC to the National League of Cities for no more than five students and the staff liaison to go. Um, I believe the last time we went in 2018, it was $5,000 because I got a sweet deal on an Airbnb <laughs> that we all stayed in. Um, so those are basically the changes that I'm proposing. I, um, our two youth counselors have a few words that they would like to share too about what they do and what they're looking forward to. All right, so I'm here to speak a little bit um, on why the youth, council, the youth Council is important to the city of Lake Oswego. So the Youth Leadership Council is an opportunity for the youth to both learn about our community and what is happening in this city, 
and it also acts as um, a way for the youth to speak up and have our voice heard on civic issues. So the unique perspective the Youth Council has to offer is what is um, important for this city. So a major portion of the city is comprised of youth, high schoolers, anybody under 18 pretty much. Um, however, we don't really get much of a say um, in uh, many issues. So having this Youth Leadership Council is crucial to the environment of Lake Oswego um, as to um, kind of get equal representation and have a large majority, uh, um, a large portion of the city have its voice heard. So in the past, the Youth Leadership Council has weighed in on community issues like a public pool, which would have positive impacts on community youth. We have also had the opportunity to learn more about government at all levels by participating in um, events Jenny mentioned earlier, like the Oregon Youth Summit and the National League of Cities Conference. So being able to attend these events is really important for us because it kind of gives us that knowledge we need um, to enter this professional realm and understand how things actually work around here. Um, so while we are youth, we are pretty young, um, getting this knowledge at an early age is really important so we can decide um, how to positively affect our community most of us on the Youth Council really love LO. That's why we're on the Youth Council. Um, so we want to direct our passion for this city of Lake Oswego um, positively in any way we can. So being able to attend these events, being able to have our voices heard is really important for us. Uh, we also enjoy learning about city operations from staff when we tour fire stations and the water treatment plant, which we're going to be doing October this year, I believe. And we would like to do more of this in the future. Um, so these little things, they kind of add up to broaden our perspective, to give us um, more, uh, to give us different viewpoints on aspects that are crucial to this community. Um, and as we gain more of these viewpoints, um, the more positive uh, impacts we can have on this city. Um, so I applied to the Youth Leadership Council this past year uh, because I am kind of new to the city of Lake Oswego. I moved here uh, about three years ago from Pennsylvania um, and I really fell in love with this place. Where I moved from, it was pretty outdoor centric like LO is too. But coming here and seeing how everyone is always outside, how every house has a pet dog and everyone's walking around the neighborhood with their dogs, um, that kind of, that atmosphere just um, made me really passionate about the city. It makes me happy to be outside, to be doing these things around the city. Um, so I uh, applied to the Youth Council so I can kind of become more involved in these things, see how the city works, the city I love so much, how it functions. Um, and I really hope that with this coming year and the following years, um, the Youth Council will be able to continue to positively affect this community by giving a unique perspective and a unique voice and having the opportunities to um, see these things and see uh, how the city works. Thanks. Okay, so I think I will start with talking about why I decided to apply for Youth Leadership Council, um, just to transition. So I am a little bit different. I've lived in Lake Oswego for most of my life. I've lived in Lake Oswego for about how old? 13 years. Um, and I also love Lake Oswego. I think it, I am super privileged to be able to grow up here, but I think there are a few issues. And I applied to Youth Leadership Council um, to be able to try to change or enact change um, in a way that I think is positive. Um, and maybe, can I go into a few of the issues? Okay, so I think, um, and this also has to do with Youth Leadership Council's just main agenda. Um, I think while Lake Oswego is a pretty tight-knit community, I think there are some issues of inclusion. I see this at school. I also see this just in the community in general. And I think Youth Leadership Council is a really, really good way um, and 
a good way to represent as many of the young teens and children that we see uh, that are in our community. So I think not only should we be looking to better ourselves through experiences by learning about the city government, like um, you talked about, and and like going to fire fireplaces, <laughs> firehouses and stuff, I think we should also look to be role models and representatives for the entire community. And so we do this many ways. Um, one of the ways is through a program called Elo Speaks, which Miss um, Lepian mentioned, and basically, I'm sure you maybe all know that Elo Speaks is um, like a TED Talk where you bring in um, a lot of students and teens of different backgrounds and they talk about their experiences. And that's just one way that we can let every teen in our community know that they are included and they are a part of something greater and they are not alone. Um, I think that's just really important as a council that, again, that we serve as like a representat representation. Um, for teens. Um, we also, again, we also participate in events like Shred Day and Community Cleanup Day, um, and we use these events not only because they're beneficial to our community, but we also use the events and the profits generated from these events to um, help uh, to raise money for different organizations, like we did Lines for Life. Um, and then, so also going forward, we would like to collaborate more with other youth organizations, such as um, Youth Action Council and the Teen Library Board, which, um, and that obviously makes sense because we're all trying, we're all teens who are passionate about our community and trying to make a difference. Um, so it's really important that we don't try to isolate our own organization because ultimately we're just one big group. Um, and yeah, we're still brainstorming ideas for our focus this school year. Thank you. <laughs> Do you both agree with the proposed recommendations that Ms. Slippian has made for accountability and that sort of thing? I agree. I think it's really important if you're going to apply to something as important as Youth Leadership Council, um, and it is really important, I think, in a community, if you want the community of teens to feel included, I think it's really important to commit and like promise that you will commit. Um, if you're a part of something, again, this important and you don't commit, it just, the effect and the importance of it goes away. Okay. Question. I was just saying, I'll ask you, do you agree as well? Oh, uh, yeah, completely. Um, That's fine. As Ellie mentioned, it's really important and just having um, continued attendance uh, only bolsters this council. Uh, when we interviewed students from both high schools for the advisory positions on our advisory boards, it was just amazing. And uh, Councilor Wynn and I and Councilor Mann came to the conclusion that the folks that didn't make the seven slots, let's get them as al alternates because they were, they were incredible. So I like the idea of rethinking now five years later. But one thing I'd like to see us work a little more is the input into what we do from mm -hmm. the students. And one way maybe to plug them closer into the advisory boards, even though we have students on there now. But I just think if we can figure out vehicles to get that input to us, uh, you know, the two-way street, it's not just mm -hmm. going to the water plant, but what do you think of the water? What do you think of this issue that would be helpful, I think, for me? So I support what you're, what you're proposing. It does remind me that I forgot my sixth point. Oh, and that was? Which was <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> to meet the city time. council. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, to have or an organized, you know, at least a meet and greet, if not a joint meeting once a year. And we try and vet these issues through our advisory board. So if there is a hot issue that we're working on, maybe you guys could sit in at the same time and give some more advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Councilor Colhoff. So I had a question. Uh, when I heard about the proposals, one of the things that I was hoping would be added, and it still could if you thought this would work, uh, even as a counselor, uh, some of the most beneficial opportunities are going around to see the fire stations, to talk to the police. I uh, did a ride along. Um, those are the times where you actually learn something that you're not going to learn through the packets or any other way. <clears throat> so it would be my hope that to the extent you have time to slip that kind of uh, educational piece in so that when you do come back with your voice, it is even more educated. Thank you both for coming in, and thank you for joining the Youth Leadership <laughs> Council. I am so impressed. I've, I've been a part of this since the beginning, and 
the quality of people year after year has been tremendous. And thank you. This is really awesome. <laughs> you don't have the button. Uh, well, I'm, uh, question: Can we've supported financially this group? I mean, is it in the budget already, or kind of? It comes it out of be? the city manager's fund to about about five thousand a year, and when we haven't gone to DC, really, it's just been pizza and T-shirts. Right. Okay. What? Well, can okay. we can make we make a motion? motion? Oh. Let me make a motion we direct staff to implement proposed changes to the Youth Leadership Council as presented. Second. Second. Go ahead. Okay, I think we're... We're seconded. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank well you both. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. We're asking, oh. we're taking one item off the consent agenda, which is in July 16, 2019, regular meeting minutes. So other than that, do you move the consent agenda on that? Yes. Okay. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? No. Right. Just one thing. Right? Council Lamont, you wanted uh, yeah. minutes for July 16. Change? Yes, there's a correction on page 7 to 12, and it said uh, something to effect, because I don't have it in front of me now, that uh, I said that I did not support lusher farm improvements because the park and rec center was more important. What I actually said was I don't support, at this time, new facilities, but I do support the parking and the trail projects. So if we take the word more work and put in the word new facilities, that will be more clarification of what I said. And I think... And Marie's got that right. Madam Recorder, have you done that or can I you haven't do done that? that, so what we'll do is remove those and bring them back to you at the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The next item on the, is a consent agenda for a resolution uh, appointing appointments of the 50 plus advisory board. Has everybody had a chance to look at those? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, now it's time for the fun time to get that majority of this project. Is that before the sweet sweeper? Or? Come on up. The sweet sweeper. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, that was on the consent. Yeah. The board we got a name in again? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, Oscar is actually the initial of uh, Oswego, Sweeper, whatever. <laughs> Boy, we could have Bert and Ernie out there. That's right, that's right. How about Cookie Monster? That would be good for a Sweet Sweeper. Charlie, look at you guys. Officials. Kirsten, you're over here. Liz is over here. Eli's over there. Laura's over here. Hello. How are you? Well, first of all, let me take a minute and say thank you. This is our normal meeting time. It's not for you, so. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with us and join me. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> I understand the purpose here to primarily discuss the joint needs of the schools and the city and map out procedures to address those needs uh, within our separate budgets, of course. For example, presently, the pool is on school property is available at times for community use, and at the same time, we do field maintenance and that kind of thing for, for you folks. Um, we, as you know, we just passed the $30 million parks bond, and that's our limit for capital expenditures over the next several years on, as far as parks and recreation go. And we don't have, we really, at this point, don't have solid numbers for most of the projects that are listed there. Um, for the city, though, I think we, we've got some immediate things we're going to do. We're going to do the <coughs> restrooms and the ADD stuff. We want to do the remodel of the ACC, 
and uh, a couple of things like that over the next year that will take three, four million dollars out of that bond. But there, we've already got things going on that, and we know pretty much what we need to do in the immediate future. I think we're open to other th things as we go along. You, we, you guys had your ad hoc meeting with some very good, looked like a very good meeting with some good suggestions, and we're open to, to participating in that kind of stuff too. But right now, uh, as you know, we're discussing as much of this as a moving target. We don't know exactly where the numbers are going to come out or that kind of thing. So it's a good thing we're having this meeting to get to find out which directions we want to go in. I would like, I'd like to make one request, too, and that is that when we're speaking with people outside our boards, that we speak with one voice if we can, one voice for each group. In our case, it'll be new city manager Bennett. I assume in your case it'll be Superintendent LaCruz. But the, the problem is, if we don't do that, it gets all sorts of turmoil started in, this, in the city about this is going to be done, that's going to be done, this isn't, that isn't. So it'd be good if we could keep our, uh, keep our message as coherent as possible. That's my hope. Anyway, so let's proceed. So uh, I thought what we would do is Superintendent Dale Cruz took some awesome notes at right. the meeting that we had the other day. <laughs> and uh, uh, perhaps she could summarize sort of what we talked about and then ask Charity and Jan to give you a brief overview of the work that we've done to sort of better understand just the city facilities and, how, and the school district facilities and how they're being used and then open it up for the three topics that you guys have on your agenda for just conversation. Okay. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds like a good plan. All right. Thank you, Superintendent. However you'd like. Okay. I thought it just might be good for yeah. folks to at least kind of introduce, introduce ourselves, and if I can provide maybe just 60 cents, seconds of introductory comments, if that's okay, before we kind of deep dive into meeting notes and things. But I'm Rob Wagner, board chair, Lake Oswego School Board this year. Liz Hartman, vice chair. Am I pushing that? Kirsten Aird. Board member. Board member. <laughs> and John Wallen, board member. Sarah Poffington, board member. Eli Count, student representative. Um, Tony Vandenberg, executive director of project management, school district. Jan Wirtz, recreation superintendent. Charity Taylor, management analyst. David Powell, city attorney. John Wallen, city councilor. Teresa Goldhoff. Jackie Mann, city councilor. I'm Ken Studebaker, <laughs> president and mayor. <laughs> Skip O'Neill, city councilor. John Lamont, city councilor. Uh, Daniel Wynn, city councilor. And I'm Martha Bennett. And so just maybe um, if we, oh, did you not? Laura Dale Cruz. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, we were going right into the minute notes, and so I was just like, you know, 14 weeks on the job, and she's already so slipstreamed into our, um, our team. But I would just say over the, um, in concert with our mayor, just as peremptory comments. Uh, first of all, how much we appreciate the opportunity. I know uh, the mayor expressed some real interest to go deep this evening, maybe four hours or so. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, I think that was the <laughs> oh, you know so well. I, I think that was the tension. We know that it's beautiful outside, and I have a feeling people want to move on to other activities. Uh, I would say as well to Sam, uh, since my name was brought up in, in context this evening, that I look forward to our carpool. So, um, I'm getting a Prius. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I'm sure there's some sort of in-kind I'd have to provide on that. Um, and I know that this is the second meeting that we've had uh, in a few months and how much I appreciate the opportunity to strengthen the partnership that we have between our schools and our city council because I think as a community, regardless of whether or not it's a pool or fields or programs, I think the residents of our community look to us to come together around partnership opportunities. Um, I, I know that we'll have an introduction of Dr. De La Cruz, uh, but I specifically want to acknowledge how much our board is so appreciative of your coming here from Colorado and uh, how well she has been incredibly received by our staff and our students and our community. And we also thank you so much for the warm welcome that you provided as she's transitioning with her husband and fun labradoodle, uh, Maisie, into our community. So, um, And then the, the last thing I'll say is I was watching 
uh, an interview with General Mattis this week, who's written a new book, and he paraphrased George Washington's leadership, and that was to first hear, then listen, then learn, and then lead. And I think we're still in the listen and learn session right now, but we do have a responsibility to our voters within the bond to lead on the pool, um, specifically and in partnership around our fields, uh, as we do know that we are time limited in terms of when we actually have to build out our facilities. So um, we have amazing staff, we have committed community, um, and we know that our mission is focused on our students, but it doesn't have to end there. Um, and we truly hope that we can continue to strengthen that partnership. And with that, I'll definitely turn it over to our amazing new superintendent, Dr. De La Cruz. Thank you for that introduction to our work together. I also appreciate that we are able to come to the table together and begin carving out um, whatever commitments are most realistic and will serve our community together. In a short summary of our meeting last week, last Wednesday, we came together with some members from our school board and our staff, as well as members from Parks and Recreation um, staff and City Council. And at that meeting, in summary, we came together to explore a collaborative relationship and to begin carving out understandings of avail supply and demand, if you will, of our available assets in the city in terms of recreational facilities and their use. And begin considering some next steps. The discussion really centered around not only building the collaborative working strategies together toward next steps, but also beginning to look at what Ivan shared as an assessment of our current assets in the community and to begin considering pros and cons of different designs of pools and which community members we could serve with each of those designs as well as how we could partner on whatever the implications are of any particular design in terms of how, for instance, youth athletic fields might be affected by a pool or a track or any of those things. We also began exploring potential or further discussions around potential locations. And Tony gave um, an update about the RFP process that he can certainly share in more detail. I will just share that the RFP process for a school uh, pool Oh, they rhyme. School and pool. <laughs> Architect design firm has been completed, and the review process involved both members of the Lake Oswego School District staff and Parks and Recreation staff. A firm was named, and that firm is Opsis. Opsis architecture firm has designed many pools and has a lot of experience in designing and managing pools, so we look forward to partnering with them in the design of a few options and looking at what the, the cost will be of that, the implications, potential locations, what would work, what wouldn't work, and, and discussing the pros and cons of those as we consider our partnership. Our hope and intention for this conversation tonight is that we can carve out next steps in perhaps time commitments so that we know when we will come to the table again and when we'll, when we'll each know more about what we can commit to. Do you guys want to give a quick summary? Absolutely. Good evening, city council members and school board members. My name again is Charity Taylor. I am a management analyst with Lake Oswego Parks and Recreation Department. And again, to my right is Jan Words, Recreation Superintendent. This evening, we're just going to give you a brief overview of facility usage for gym use and for athletic field use. And so I'll go ahead and get started on the athletic field side. Total with the uh, city of Lake Oswego and also the city of our city of Lake Oswego and uh, Lake Oswego School District, we have 35 fields for baseball, softball, football, soccer, and lacrosse. So lots of sports, 35 fields total. Between 2011 and today, there's been a net loss of three fields, and those fields are at Uplands. There were two, one baseball and softball field, and then a multi-use rectangular field. And then there was also a rectangular field at Pilkington Park, which is now a dog park. And so just as a caveat here, we did assume that there was one rectangular field at Lake Ridge and then another at Lake Oswego High School that is limited community use. So that is something to keep in mind as well. 
We have not built new fields per se, but there are new fields that are available. So for example, at East Waluga that now has two newly turfed multi-use rectangular fields. And then to go into usage, the most common reservation time is between 4.30 p.m. and 10 p.m., which when we think about it makes sense because that's when students are out of school, that's when parents are done with work, that's usually when people are, are really trying to get through that recreation time and use our fields. We have seen a decrease in league participation for all sports except for soccer. And although there has been this decrease in participation, there is, uh, we do have to account for a season overlap as well as rainouts and conflicting time practice still does necessitate, necessitate the need for additional fields. So with that in mind, a couple of recommendations. Uh, first would be to potentially implement the Receive Master Plan, which would uh, increase our facilities by two uh, rectangular fields and two baseball softball fields. And then another one is what I just call wait and see, because we did have a lot of maintenance go on in our ball fields. Um, for example, East Waluga ball fields were recently turfed. There was a re-turfing project on Hazalia fields. So uh, when I was interviewing the youth sports organizations, uh, one of the issues that came up is, hey, you know, East Waluga wasn't available. So when we allow for that to cycle through and for those youth sports organizations and other um, entities who are using our fields to actually be able to use the newly available fields, that might al alleviate some of the pressure that we're seeing in terms of um, our field usage. One caveat to this report is that it compares 2018 to 2011. Or, and so with that, um, we don't really have a trend line in terms of what it looks like for league participation. So that is something to keep in mind. And so with that, if there are no questions about that part of fields right off the bat, yeah. certainly, ma'am. Um, how long would it take you to have a reasonable trend line if you were looking at it from now, would it be like next year that you could do that? Likely next year because we could do uh, potentially 17, 18, 19. That would, that would be and a so possibility. next year being like um, mid-2020? Mid right, probably about mid-2020 to about, um, 2019 to cycle all the way through. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. Of course. Um, any indication in your research as to why sports has dropped off from 2011? till today? It's a multitude of reasons. For example, with football, it could be because there's been a lot of press and issues around injuries, things of that nature. In terms of baseball, it's just something that we've just been seeing steadily, not only with youth sports organizations, but also with our city leagues as well, especially with lacrosse. So it's really a multitude of reasons, but not one in particular, not one that's, particular that's, reason. that stood out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, when I went through the 2011, it looked like a total of eight fields were needed at that time give or take one if Little League was double counting. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we've added anything in 2011 except for fixing Azalea and-, and Fixing, Swiga. correct. Mm -hmm. So if we were short eight, and then I looked at the 2019 report and it mm -hmm. said, well, if we go ahead and do Reseek, we get two baseball and two soccer, but we're not hitting anywhere near eight. Mm -hmm. And that's not including Lake Ridge Junior High, which if a track goes in, we're gonna lose two or three or four or five, what? depending on who you talk to. So how many do we really need? I think we may need to get at it still, but how many do you think we need? You're correct, Councilman. We do still need to get at it, but what we're thinking at this point, at least initially, is because we've seen such a drastic decrease in all of the sports except for soccer, uh, implementing the Receipt Master Plan, and then also seeing how uh, the turf fields will alleviate that pressure on demand for um, recreational field use, we're going to kind of wait and see how that plays out and then see what that would look like. And the other thing that you raised, which I thought was great, was trying to squeeze out more use of some fields that if they were increased by five feet on either side, mm -hmm. they might be a more standard or usable field. And that's going through all of the school district and our fields together, right? Just Correct. seeing which ones would be appropriate. And then in the report that the architects did for the school district in May of 2019, they did little layouts in all the fields, in all the schools. And I saw Palisades Field, I think, is there, but it's not really a ball field. Uh, Uplands is there, not being maintained, but there look like two or three that could be there. And then I think River Grove has huge amounts of green land next to the other field that was proposed. So I'm thinking, can we squeeze a few more out, either with dimensions or going to some of these sites on the schools and working it into our intergovernmental agreement? So we make sure we don't get short after Lake Ridge's track goes in and all that other stuff. Um, I, I had a question also about uh, usage um, and the, the numbers declining. How is that being measured? Is that people signing up with leagues associated with the city, or are we tracking actual um, 
students and where they go because we've, we've heard from some of our sports leagues that many students are playing in our, our, our students are playing in other leagues in other cities mm. partially as a result of reduced space. So I just want to make sure that we're tracking these numbers accurately. Um, so we're really accounting for uh, students and we're well, not students, should I say, but participants within the city of Lake Oswego. So not accounting for those who might be playing on outside leagues. So that so. would that, so that would include people from other or, uh, participants from other cities playing in our leagues Correct. as well. Okay. Correct. And then um, okay. And then I hope that uh, Mr. Vandenberg has a chance to, to update on the the actual change in fields because. The numbers that you you cited two or three are out there and i think it's it's actually less than that based on our current configurations okay. as long as we're keeping that in mind because we're going to lose it at lake ridge i have something. i have a question for you uh, related to uh, the drop in activities i think it's important that we're communicating with the schools to see uh, one if they're dropping or two they have a sport that's growing that we're not participating in. Uh, I think it would be a big concern on everybody at this table if overall youth are not out there being active. I think we want them right. in some way to be active, not sitting at home. And what are other sports that we should be, you know, having in front of them that they're more interested in? And, yeah, uh, and if I may just build on that. We, had a, we started our day meeting with the, the Joint Task Force, the ad hoc group, and then we ended our day that same day meeting with uh, representatives from the Lake Oswego Youth Sports Council who ha told a very s different story yeah. regarding mm -hmm. um, activity and inability to access fields and um, using fields outside of the city for that reason and really came to the table with a plea for us to work to enhance and add to fields for that reason. So there, we're, I think we're trying to reconcile mm -hmm. what you're sharing and and what we've heard is a, a very clear plea from the community of uh, Lake Oswego Youth Sports Coalition. Well, I think that's what we hear every year at the Budget Committee. And the gentleman that kind of speaks for all of them who was at the forum that we talked about earlier, he had a lot of numbers that came back to us at the amount of participants, but also if we were cleaned up and had better facilities, we'd be getting more people and more tournaments. I think it's the same thing with pool, tennis courts, and the golf course, and the fields. If they're better and people will come, we're going to get more use. But I think Skip's point of is it lacrosse and soccer that's taking over football and hardball, or what, to make sure we're accommodating that? Or is it cross country? <laughs> or we, we, why are we building a fabulous cross country? You know, Thanks. facility. I mean, um, well, I mean, we know. I mean, the school district told us that track and field is a growing sport within uh, the junior high and high school level. They have more kids out for track and field than they ever have. So, I mean, I'm happy to see, you know, we're building a, another track for that. But once again, we might have, I don't, I don't know what the numbers might be at junior high for kids that are out for cross country. It might be huge. And so, we should have a great cross country left Lesser Farm. If you walk it, what a beautiful place to have a world class, you know, cross country facility. So, um, I have um, a question, suggestion. Would it be possible somehow to have the youth sports league or committee? I'm sorry, I forgot the title. Provide their information on usage so that we could kind of compare and have staff compare and contrast or have charity work with that and see um, where there might be some differences, especially if they're saying that these numbers or um, the usage is extremely different. Um, yeah, I believe that would inform all of us. I think so. I think that would be a kind of a data driven approach to uh, looking yes. at this. Right. And we need the spreadsheet. Oh, go ahead. Well, we need the spreadsheet of <coughs> supply and demand. And I think there's there's a couple things with numbers. I mean, I, one of the things that we don't look at is uh, timing of use of fields, which I know that you guys are hammered for. And we've said it before, it's difficult for um, first graders to be practicing at 9 o'clock at night because that's when the field is available. Part of our challenge is to try to meet demand with our supply at the right time frames 
Uh, and that's something I think uh, I've heard it from many parents where uh, there's a hierarchy of the sports teams where if a field is wet and can't be played on, then the younger kids don't get to play on it because the senior kids get the play time on it and it kind of goes down in a hierarchy. And so we're kind of um, screwing the little kids uh, up field time sometimes. And if they can't play, then they may not be you know, coming out and, and participating. So I think it's the, you know, if, if, you were, if it was a perfect world, we'd know, we'd know demand. But I don't know if we fully can get that, but I think we need to build in some capacity uh, beyond what we're looking at. And I think for me, and, and I think Tony and Jan and Ivan and Charity all fall into the kind of let's working together category now because I, I appreciate our new directors here uh, bringing us together along with the board and the council. So if we're going through with a fine tooth comb and finding out are there fields that could be expanded that would be a standard size for whatever level and what school activities stop and start, when do they end? And if the kids are playing at five or something right after school and we can't use it, then we shouldn't put it in the pot for using it. Um, and then really, I think we have to be careful because when you listen to the different sports folks, especially the one that's courting it all, that demand's up there. And I think it would just be bigger and better. And when I think about also the ripple effect of economic development of all these tournaments going to the city, uh, I had someone bring up the other day on the street the idea of a, a triathlete thing in the city, but there's no facilities yet. So I think if we can really look at what do we have, how can we expand and use them, as long as the schools say that's really truly available. Because if it's not, you know, parking wisers, you know, the kids are out playing their own games up until six or seven, it's not available. And just fine tune these numbers because to go from eight needed in 2011 to down to two and two, and then not even including Lake Ridge yet, which we're going to hear about, uh, I think we just got to be careful, make sure we do it right. Yeah. And, and I'll just add one, one thing to that um, talking about other facilities. One of the things that the Youth Sports Coalition pointed out to us is that um, a lot of the, the sports, you know, it, uh, will start to back up. So baseball games get rained out, starts to bleed into soccer season, everything's on grass, some fields tend not to be usable. You know, they were begging, of course, for more, more turf um, to be built or many of our grass fields to be turf. I, I have my, my own opinions on, on putting turf on everything, but um, I, I certainly see the, the, the point of um, we have grass and mud versus a playable surface. It creates, it creates extra, extra stress on the fields. One so more. John said the ripple effect through the whole system. Yeah. One more follow up on on your comments, Councillor Lamont. Um, the Sports Coalition also mentioned some of the um, additional amenities that could come into Lake Oswego um, if we are able to host tournaments. So they were talking about um, the I think it was the Lake Oswego Cup, mm -hmm. the yeah. soccer yeah. tournament, um, with mo with most of which had to be played outside of Lake Oswego. So people coming in from out of town aren't staying in Lake mm -hmm. Oswego hotels, they're not eating at Lake Oswego restaurants, right? So it's a big opportunity um, for the city businesses, local businesses as well. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the reasons we turfed East, East Maluga. So we're going to be watching that to see if some of that comes to fruition. Oh, it will come to fruition. I guarantee you that. Because I, I think I, we've lived with this situation now for, I don't know, some of the older people on the boards I mean, for 10 years. I mean, I think we've had a shortage of fields. Uh, well, we're not that old, but. Uh, <laughs> well, he was going to apply for the 50 plus. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right. No, but I, I we've, um, I would say in comparison to other communities, uh, we're probably a B or a B minus, uh, and you look at some of the surrounding communities that have invested. Uh, they've got A plus facilities, and I, it's I, I don't think it's up to the Lake Oswego standards myself. Uh, and I think we need to give the opportunity. Uh, we can't. I, I've heard time and time again where people can't get field space, they can't get gym space, um, and now with the pool situation, as more and more kids are actually the swimming programs, both in uh, both high schools, uh, as well as, as uh, um, both swimming and water polo are growing, because um, it's not a contact sport, sort of. Well, at least swimming isn't supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> as but, a parent of a water polo. Yeah, right, right, you know, you know otherwise, right. Yeah. Um, but my point being is that the, 
the facilities in Lake Oswego, we have not, I think, kept up with not just the, the capacity, but the, the quality. Um, and I think this is a, like we said, Rob said, this is a, a good opportunity to, to collectively look at things and make some 50-year decisions. And I think that's important for us to, to be talking. And I'm excited, frankly, because I think we've got a, everything's lined up um, correctly. Um, just like the article in the Lake Oswego Review that said, every time you came to Oregon, the sun was out. So it was, it was good. We've got a chance to line things up with, with bonds and with the horsepower and the capacity. Um, we've got an opportunity, so let's not screw it up. So. Is this the time to hear about Lake Oswego? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to hear about Jim? Jim's prepared to talk about Jim. Well, do you want to do the fields first? What we're going to be short on Lake Ridge, if you know yet, or? Depends on the size of the pool. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And the location. Yeah. So the one-to-one -one replacement um, or a stretch 25, which would be kind of the one-to-one, -one, would uh, only impact the tennis courts that are at the northeast corner of the Lake Ridge Middle School site. As the footprint gets bigger, we begin to impact um, a, a youth soccer field. And then if we go with a larger pool, uh, 50 meter with a warm water facility, we begin to impact the um, north adult baseball field. Um, with the track scenario that has been discussed that is shown on our master plan, we lose two additional fields to the south, uh, youth baseball fields. We would lose the adult um, baseball field as well um, at the Lake Ridge site. Um, However, with the type of track configuration that we're looking at, the inside of the track would be able to house two youth baseball fields itself. Um, configuration would allow for multiple soccer fields, football field, obviously, uh, and full um, six-lane track at this point is kind of what we're contemplating. Um, that project is not yet funded, um, similar to the um, pool, depending on how big we go right now. Um, we have $7 million for a pool, um, and we're forecasting that we would have some money left and from no premium. Funds for the track yet. No funds for the track yet. When did you anticipate making a decision on that? So last time we met, which was May, I believe, um, I said March of this coming year. Okay, that's fine. Just curious. Holds true. Um, I could say with some certainty before that, but it would be probably less than what we would ultimately end up with. So our joint work needs to look at the range of the minimum amount of impact on the fields to the maximum if the whole show goes in. Correct. And my understanding with working with Ivan is that um, I've shared both of the proposed configurations for both the north side campus, which includes Uplands, Lake Oswego Junior High, and the Lake Oswego High School campuses, as well as the Lake Ridge Middle School master plans. And there's some information about those in this report, if I understand correctly. So for the North Campus, Lake Oswego Junior High is scheduled for replacement during the second bond, um, should that pass, fingers crossed. Um, that would replace the school, and it would have a large multi-use field. That's, uh, that's been the, the largest kind of proposed um, uh, field configuration that we're looking at right the now. The rectangular field. Yeah, it would be okay. a rectangular field with a, with a kind of a, a separate um, area for a large baseball field right. that could come off of. Any other questions? Right. More you'd like? I, I guess one question is we, we talked about in our joint meeting that you had already determined a couple target dates that you wanted to hit yes. before March. Yes. So Ivan and I have worked on a conceptual schedule. I put together a conceptual schedule that shows us starting construction uh, early 2021. Um, to get there at this point, we would need to land on a location November of this year, and we would need to land on funding or at least have uh, an agreement on proposed funding in March of this coming year. And so time sticking, I guess. <clears throat> location is, is incredibly important because as we get in through the planning phase, early schematic design, uh, we begin to just waste money in, in design at that point. Thank you, Jim. Are we going to talk about some other locations as well, or is that 
the only location we're going to talk about. You guys about. are talking about multiple locations for the pool, correct? We've heard some conversations about a golf course. We've heard a little bit about that tonight. Um, certainly, it's not um, district property. Um, we also have the current location of the pool. Um, it's not necessarily conducive to a large development, and there's a number of things that would need to happen at that site, including a lot more parking to uh, make it really feasible. Possibly could happen at a later date. However, we kind of need a pool now. So Lake Ridge Middle School is the site that the district, um, the school board has proposed as the location. Um, and until um, our last meeting in May of last year, uh, or this year, we, um, we were going with that site. Um, we heard some things about other locations, and, and the golf course could be a potential location. It's, uh, it's something that we're not opposed to uh, exploring. But that's, that's city property. Correct. Yeah. What if it's an option? I understand. What if you looked at the Upland site, which is very big, and I saw how much field work you got in there. It was pretty good planning. Is there an opportunity there? to get it in between the junior high and uplands or the future schools or rearranging the schools, uh, whether it loses a field or not. I mean, it's a central location. It's a big site. It's a fairly large site. Right now, it's acting as a school. Um, we just um, put a pretty significant investment into the facility itself, um, currently housing Oak Creek. In the future, it would house several other schools as we go through renovations during the bond programs. I'm not sure that they'd be able to before losing the field space oh, uh, at that site. Has there been any discussion about um, the fields that are adjacent to the golf course that, that, are, that are on the, the Lake Ridge High School side? I mean, there's been talk about maybe if, there, if we, you know, co-house uh, the Parks and Rec at the golf course facility, still maintain the golf course as it is, but perhaps if it's going to be um, something the city, if the school board is already wanting to uh, build the, the, the pool, maybe build it on school property, but instead of building at the Lake Ridge Junior High, possibly Lake Ridge High School, I know that that would be mean sacrificing fields there. Um, is that um, at all part of the calculation to see what the net result, if we didn't build it at junior high, build it at the high school, is that? I think that our design team will help us with the planning effort. We've basically told them that you know, all options are there. Here's what we know at this point, but let's take a deep dive and we'll bring options forward. So Ivan will be working with the city. I'll be working with the school board and hopefully we're all working together on the best scenario. We have heard um, from the community that um, uh, the co-join recreation center pool warm water facility would be fantastic. Um, that's kind of been an overwhelming conversation that uh, having them separate or at separate sites would be to the detriment of the users. Um, so I, I can understand the benefit there by having um, the uses at a single site. Um, but again, we'll, we'll be exploring these as we move forward with our design teams. And then, and then the question would be, I think where Councilor Wynn's going, is there's land there, obviously some of its fields and tennis courts, but if there was a footprint that had the small pool complex, pool with community, the pool with community and park and rec, and then we can see how big the bag is and does it fit, right. and what are the repercussions. If we would build Rasik new and take out the baseball field there at Lake Ridge, would that help or hurt? Is that a better site? Uh, I just think now is the time for creativity and the fact that we're working closer together, now is the time to do it and not avoid ideas. So one of the questions I have, not to probably be answered tonight, but for us to consider is I've heard some, I've read in notes different opinions on who manages and operates the pool facility. And I think it's going to be really important for a decision making process that that stake is placed in the ground. And it sounds like if we need to figure out a location by November to get a build in 21, one side is going to have to say we're willing to operate and maintain this thing. And I think that is going to be really important in figuring out where this is located. I, I, I could be wrong. I could say that we can, you know, one of the government entities can manage and operate something on another governmental entity's property, possibly. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I do think it's really important to get clear sooner rather than later which entity is going to be responsible for operating and maintaining this facility so that we can make a really educated decision about location 
Well, so again, the, probably not to be yeah. stated tonight, but... No, but I mean, one of the things is that there's two things. There's the golf course, and then there's a swim pool, and yeah. we each get one. So <laughs> who wants to have what? And in all seriousness, I mean, both of, both of the entities, the city has, has been running the golf course at not necessarily a profit. You guys have been running the uh, pool at not necessarily a profit. Um, and so it's historically been in each other's operating budgets. Uh, how you change that and put a burden and switch it. I mean, we could run the pool if you want to run the golf course. I mean, <laughs> it, but I think there's, there is that part. The other thing that we have to determine is the size of the pool um, is one thing. This operating cost of the pool is something else. And I think that's, you know, everybody wants to have a 100 meter pool, I'm sure now with a, you know, divider and warm slides and and everything else. Beach entry. Right, beach entry. And, and uh, but if it's going to be a million dollar operating expense, um, somebody's going to have to pony up and pay for that. And neither of us have that in our budgets. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I, and I don't know if you want to talk about Newburgh or not, um, whether that's a conversation. Call, call off your Are you sure you don't want to go no, first? No, please. <clears throat> there are a couple things we do know, and one is that the community does want this pool. Mm -hmm. They want a pool for their kids, a competitive pool, and they want a community pool, which means rec and it means a warmer pool. And I get it that you're up against the wall to get this going. Uh, Lake Ridge sounds like a disaster from my perspective. Uh, the golf course is pretty tight, um, and when I read through the materials again, I could see, though Ivan had said that we could work the, the rec center, we could work the pool, the aquatic center, meaning the community pool along with the competitive pool there at the golf course, the potential of moving out into some of the district's property. Um, it's going to make some people very unhappy about uh, going down to a nine-hole golf course. But uh, the golf course is a, is a serious proposition, and, and um, we need to get this in our heads that the community wants an aquatic center. I sat through all of those task force meetings with the school district, and a stretch pool is not going to pack it. It's just not. They need the 50 meters for their own uses, and those are your kids. We need the community aspect, because that's going to help pay for this. You're talking about maintenance. You're ta Councilor Wendland was the one saying that 60% of the people there in Newburgh at that 18 million dollar everything were from paying customers. Um, I don't know too much about Upmonds, but that'd be fantastic because it's just up Springbrook Park and I'd be there every day. So <laughs> you can just put that right in there. We'll the other we have, center behind your house. Yeah. You, know what, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then one other location that we haven't talked about, but does appear to be flat, Rizik, which doesn't have the, the downsides that, um, you know, are engineering and built in with this and that, that, you know, you're going to cut into somebody's fields, you're going to cut trees, you're going to take out the tenants. I mean, it's just endless reasons why we can't get this done. Um, and then the third thing, or the last thing I'm going to say, it's obvious that I'm a pool proponent. But I'm not the only one in the community that wants this. And the second was um, the fields. So those are really our two priorities, right, for the whole community. I'd like for us to take a step back and not get all worked up about who's going to pay and maintain this and because we've never had any facts before us we've never had it so that's that that we had we knew for a fact that it was going to cost a million dollars or it was going to cost two hundred thousand or whatever so i think that's way premature 
that's what I think. Okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> you want more? <laughs> no. no. Thank you. I'll go if you don't mind. Um, I appreciate what you said, Councillor Kohlhoff, about moving it to the, the far south side of the city. The one problem that we have with the far south side of the city is public transportation, um, which is why I think I've said before, I like the Lake Ridge Junior High option. Um, I think from an equity standpoint, you would be able to reach a lot more of the community with a location off of major streets where we know that there is public transportation. Um, you know, the traffic issue at that part of town is bad and it will eventually get worse. But more than that, I want to make sure everyone in any pool situation has the ability to get there, whether they're relying upon public transportation, whether they're walking, whether they're riding a bicycle or driving. So I really want to keep that in mind in having this conversation about location. Um, there may be, I know there's downsides to the Lake Ridge Junior High location. I totally understand that. It's embedded in the middle of a neighborhood. <coughs> The south side would not be, but um, I mean, it'd be far more amenable if we could get TriMet to, to commit to running buses down there every 30, 40 minutes. But that, in my experience, it's not going to happen. So in having this, I, I just want to state right up front that I like Lake Ridge Junior High. The other part, and to Ms. or Board Member Aird's um, point, is uh, I think it is important to look at cost of maintenance. Um, you know, to, to say that it's premature to even think about it is, is I'm going to sound like, it's not fiscally sound to do that because it is quite a bit of money. We're talking a million a year with maybe a $500,000 in revenue. So we've got a, let's say, a net of a $500,000 cost. Well, no, I, I mean, this number there, has been but, thrown but, around. OK, so let's say it's 500000 Jackie, well, we don't huh. know. that's why we have problems. We throw numbers out with no basis. I, I would say, just like the mayor said, unbelievably capable people on our city side and on right. the school side that are going to vet this. We have two awesome people up here, and they're going to bring us something that, yeah, we're going to have to vote okay, on. Okay, I, I will... if we sit here I will back and politicalize off on, and not, make speeches about all these grand things, then we're doing a disservice to the citizens. And I agree with that. I'm just stating that I think it's important that we talk about. I think they're going to tell consider. us the size of the pool, where I do it's too. going to be, what it's going it's to cost us. I, I do too. It's Please don't think that I think that decision. money isn't important to maintain it. I am saying that we don't have any facts and it's time to get facts. And I would add that at the Thursday forum that the Parks and Recreation Department hosted on our bond, uh, a word came out almost uh, from every participant, and that was co-location. Mm -hmm. And you brought it up, you brought it up, you brought, we've all brought it up, is to let's be smart about that. Instead of the one in the pipeline, and let's look at that, is it pool, park and rec, tennis center, adult center? What can we do to make the biggest bang for the buck and have staff in one location serving our people? Now, we lost it and missed it on the web building. That's water over the dam. But now we got to go back and think about how can we do that? Should it be the long range where uh, adult center go? Should it be library? Should it be park and rec center? And I know that gets people freaked out because it's like a gigantic facility. But if there's efficiencies, we should be looking at that. And it may end up in a school, uh, a park site, or it may end up in a school site. And then we've got to figure out just what Curtis has said. What about operations? So I think we got to be careful to be make sure we are creative. And think of the 50-year horizon. I think John's been pounding away at that, the 50-year horizon that we have here. And is there co-location co opportunities? And that night, we heard a lot of them. And that people were just saying, should we spend X on this facility or put that X into a co-located project? That's all. 
Liz? I'd, I'd just like to kick in on this, uh, following up on Councillor O'Neill, on looking at what is the next big sport. And one of the groups that we don't always hear being evaluated for youth sports and everything is the pool community and what their projection is for, for usage. So we really do need to keep them in the mix of where sports and athletics are going because it isn't just the youth that are looking at increasing the pool, it's the older people who are using the pools as well. Great. I, I wonder if staff too, if there could be a bullet added on just a surface transportation utilization study, because I, I would hazard that the pool's current location from living in that neighborhood and somebody who used to ride the TriMet 78 on a regular basis is not convenient to public transportation at present. I don't know too many people are walking good all or hoofing it up hazel. Right. So, so you totally know, I, I appreciate that in the future. <laughs> yeah, there's there's one. I pick them up on the road. We hear about good all a lot. <laughs> so yes. Yeah. So. So, uh, just to kind of close this, I mean, can we get? Is there appetite for? Uh, Putting a pool and a, a um, recreation center together in one building. I mean, are we going to look at that? Is can we do that with the architect? I guess in the pool person for a feasibility. I mean, you're, talking, a you're talking about. Uh, I mean, are you guys got the architect? Are you willing to spend more money just to look at that from a concept in the planning phase and through half of schematic design until March at the latest. I think would be, yeah, absolutely. We'll be looking at it's many different right. scenarios. Right. And it would also include looking at the project as a potential phase project where we don't have to build everything now. Yeah, we could yeah. add on later. Newburgh's doing that. I mean, they have future ads for outdoor splash and that sort of thing. We have other assets that may be able to come to the site that would be part of a recreation center too in the future. Um, the gym that goes at Lake Oswego Junior High is an example of that thousand square foot gymnasium that will soon not need be needed after we replace the middle school and we could put it at the site we could put it at a shared site possible well that transitions the question on gyms if I may uh, I, I saw a number of 30,273 hours available at the gyms in all the schools which my eyes kind of popped out and I think since our IGA is 30 years old or 25 years old and I'm not sure that there's a lot of good cross connection right now on who's programming what and I keep thinking of a junior high where the kids are going out and they're having softball or whatever their sport is until a certain hour does that then shoot us in the foot for using that gym if they're doing something indoors. And uh, Ivan has indicated to me that there's gym space, but you guys can't program, and I think that, that needs to be on the table. Can we program the gyms tighter and better and not have to build a gym in a park and rec center? Because I think we've had heartburn on the size of the overall park and rec center. Or do we have to bite the bullet and put in a gym? That was the question, and I know you guys did some number crunching, but I didn't quite get a recommendation on it. I saw 30,000 hours ago, well, we got a lot of hours to use, but maybe not. Uh, are they usable? Yes, well, thank you. Um, good question, Councilman. Uh, good evening, I'm Jan Wirtz. Thank you for the introduction again, Charity. Uh, we did do a draft study report on gym utilization, and I want to just uh, go through a few of the highlights from the report. Um, it concentrates on um, indoor facilities at the school district's properties. So there's 11 schools in total. Um, there is more information that's pending, um, including some of the assumptions. Um, I wanted to take some time to thank Morgan Rausch and uh, Roxanne Stark with Community Schools for the reservation information that they did provide. Um, there's approximately, as you suggested, about a little over uh, 30,000 hours of potential um, community gym use, and that uh, utilizes after-school hours, of course, and non-school days, including weekends and some holidays. So the high school gyms are the most utilized gyms, and they also have the least amount of time available for community use. Um, December, January, February, March, and May are the most popular months, of course, indoors. Um, the community used over 10,000 hours in fiscal 1819, and then about 9,300 in fiscal 1718. Um, but during the school year, there is no use of daytime hour 
community use for gymnasiums. And that's where we are finding the most difficult time. What we discovered in par Parks and Recreation was when we were use using Palisades School um, for almost three years we were housed there, the gym utilization just at that school alone was over 1,100 hours. So a large part of the utilization from um, 1718 was Palisades School. So that's kind of where we're at right now with gym utilization, and we'll find out some more hours of the assumptions that, that I did use for, for the report. I think as Thank you. Councilor Wendell keeps saying, it's the supply and demand. So if we have a supply, can we use it? Because I think the demand's there. And, and as Ivan has said before, there's a lot of people that want to use our community space gym, whether it's day or night. And so the question is, can they really use it and making sure we don't step on the toes of the kids using it at, at the schools? And it sounds like there's less at the high school, a little more in the middle, and a lot more at grade school. I think we just need an honest school. evaluation with the staff to say, is it usable? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything further? Thank you. Well, I, you mean on the gyms? Yeah. I, well... Well, speak up. I will. <laughs> I, I, from the gym space, again, it's the, uh, we saw a big, I think there's a huge demand by the people that aren't in school during the day that want gym space. And we have zero gyms for Lake Oswego citizens during the day. So I, I, to me, that's an obvious miss that we have uh, because Jan would like to schedule that gym probably 24-7, right, all the time. So I, I do think that there's a opportunity to look at uh, additional gym space. Uh, you know, where do you put that? I'm not sure, but it it doesn't sound like it can be on a school facility or connected to a school. It might be able to be on a school facility with a different uh, exit and entrance. Um, but I, I do think that there's the need just from a uh, non-student, non-youth. Uh, uh, audience, which is about 70% of our population. So I, I think we need to, to look at that as a well, comprehensive we, we part. Will look at we will look at it. But the point is that we don't have numbers. We don't have the data yet to make those decisions. So it's, it's going to take Mr. Vandenberg, your, your expertise, and that kind of stuff to get the numbers so we can make some decisions on how to priority, prioritize things with the limited funds that we have. Um, that's not something we can do tonight, but I think you've made it, we've made it pretty clear the kinds of things we're looking at. Can I ask one question, Eli? If somebody spends seven hours a day with these prime utilizers, <laughs> <laughs> any comments before we pivot here? Um, as, as far as uh, track space and general outdoor activities goes for our youth. Um, I'd say what, what John Wallen especially was talking about is, is that what, what a lot of kids are talking about right now is just moving outside of district everything um, as far as sports go. I know people who went from playing um, sports year round every single season at Lake Ridge to moving to doing um, basketball and soccer in Portland districts and leagues. Um, so. It is something to be looking at. Our, our sport attendance might be dropping because we don't have enough space to do those things and not because students just aren't interested. Great point. Great. So before you pivot, I guess I would say, I mean, what we have is this enormous opportunity and a bit of a timing problem. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think Lori and I are going to work together as well as we can and with Ivan and other staff to try to bring you choices. But as you, I mean, you're going to talk about the Parks Bond at your next meeting. And as you contemplate the direction that you want to give us about the rollout of those parks projects, I think we'd like some direction from you and we'll try to tee it up for you on the 17th of how do you want us to deal with, like I said, what I perceive to be a, a timing problem. It'd be nice to be about six months ahead of where we are now in terms of trying to have this conversation about how to build this facility and what each party is going to bring to the table. We don't have that kind of time, so we're going to all have to sort of muddle through, but knowing that we're making an investment that's going to be sticking around for, for a long time. I don't know if I've made any sense, but um, 
I, I think the hesitation at the table right now is because we're not quite ready to have the conversation that needs to happen, but we don't have time to wait much longer. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But we made really good decisions in hiring the two of you. So, oh, okay. there you go. That's, yeah. <laughs> so we feel really no good, actually. Yeah. So, Godspeed. <laughs> so, what kind of direction are you looking for? I think the question for us is going to be essentially how much of the bond do you want to reserve to have the, the pool conversation? And okay. I don't think we know that answer yet until you answer some other questions about the bond. I mean, to be completely candid, I'm sorry, I know I'm no, no for this, but the, the elephant in the room for us is how much of the 30 million million dollars you want to reserve for the pool right and um, I don't I don't sense that you guys are in a, aligned or in agreement and ready to make that commitment some of it depends on what kind of facility we're talking about designing some of it depends on uh, what we think the community portion of the of the programming needs to happen at the pool is so we're going to try to get super smart on the Newberg numbers because I do think that's a great model we should not try to invent this ourselves but I think when we have the conversation around the parks bond I need you all to be thinking about how much of the of the bond do you want to reserve to, to commit towards the pool at some point in the future? And you don't have to land in a specific number because I'm not sure we're ready to do that. Well, tennis center, as long as we take care of that, I, I'm, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to talk anything. Well, again, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Were we going to talk about safe pathways? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My yeah. favorite come. subject. That's your subject. I mean, it's on the agenda. Did, was there a yeah. specific? Well, we've committed to about an hour of this, so let's, if we're going to do it, let's do it. Oh, safe passes. We can maybe push that. To, what's the latest on the streets about pathways? They're important for getting <laughs> young people and people of all ages Bravo. to move more <laughs> safely. I understand the yeah. engineering department is working on an assessment to match our goal that we formed yeah. in January for safer paths and trails, but with safe routes to schools is the primary push. Right. So they're coming before TAB, I think, right. and then hopefully before the council to show us that we're catching up on the goal. And we budgeted, we already set aside money on our budget for pathways. So. Well, I would just say it's a prime consideration in everything that we do that we think through the lens of student safety. Uh, if you think of what we're doing it alone with our schools around secure vestibules, communication protocols, um, increasing in partnership with you in terms of school resource officers, um, I would love to, as we build out our strategic framework for the next five years or ten years, to think about this bullet um, alongside. Um, so and I think maybe that's even another opportunity where we can build in partnership over the next few years to think about what are we doing to make sure our kids are safe as they come to and from school. And I think we had left the Dr. De La Cruz the idea of your folks getting as many of the, the, the key routes over to engineering. I'm not sure engineering reached out yet, but we were trying to get your input to say, hey, of all the schools, these are the five top or ten top. We got to fix up like near the high school and whatnot yeah. that we well, can program. And and I'll lead off of that saying um, Unlike other aspects of this, uh, you have my support 100% on safe pathways and whatever I can do to help expedite that. And I'm probably speaking for all of us here because safety is paramount. Can we I need more a... traffic guards on crosswalks. I am. Oh, I'm down. <laughs> I would do that. We're out there together. <laughs> Can I make a quick plug in this conversation sure. for the River Grove area, which is in many cases outside of the boundaries of the city of Lake Oswego. Um, and from a safe routes to school mm -hmm. perspective, yes. it's hugely underinvested. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that those neighborhoods surrounding River Grove Elementary have um, been trying very hard to problem solve in this area, looking to the district for what can we do, looking to the city um, for opportunities as well as the um, unincorporated um, Clackamas County, it's an issue that needs to be resolved. And they went after the uh, federal funding on that, and I want to be clear in our earlier discussion with the engineering staff, that's not what we're exactly saying. Getting funds from this feds would be great, but it's making our routes safe right. with whatever resources we can put together. Right. And if we get federal money, great. If not, we got to do it the other right. so, Great point. Did we hit our number, Mr. Mayor? We're pretty close. Yeah. An hour? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think we're right there. Okay, good. Again, thank you. We're gonna are you guys, take, we're gonna are you guys good? Yes, we're good. Yep. Okay. We know you guys are good? good. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> and Tony still has a look on his face. That's great. Five minutes. Yeah. We'll get all kinds of sidewalks. All kinds of sidewalks. Just Annex.
Council, officer, council have anything, information? Yes, I do. Okay. I'll make it, council I'll make it brief. Go for it. All right. Well, I just want to uh, say that our <clears throat> summer concert series, uh, thanks to Jan Wirtz, who is, oh, there she is. Hi, Jan. And Parks and Rec, uh, went extraordinarily well. The crowd at Westlake was, was beyond belief for the last concert. Uh, Neighborhood Night Out was a grand success. Shout out to uh, Lakewood Bay um, for their first year. Helen Ann Heights had a great turnout, standing room only in Free Ponds Park. Maybe not quite, but. Uh, wanted to remind everyone as library liaison that uh, the library will be down tomorrow, closed tomorrow because of a, a planned power outage. So keep that one in mind. Uh, we are wrapping up our DEI task force interviews, which had went extraordinarily well. We, we have uh, a bit more to do, and then uh, we will work through the process of recommendations and appointments to the council. Um, in addition to this, uh, I wanted to let everyone know that the Oak Grove Lake Oswego bike pad um, Bridge feasibility study policy meeting. The next policy meeting, number two, is going to be this Friday in Milwaukee. Uh, if anyone would like more information, they can go on the OGLO site, and uh, there'll be just a ton of information on that. Uh, let me see if I have anything else here. We have only that... I think that that'll that'll okay. do it. Thank Anybody you. Else? I had one small yes, thing. Yes, Council Cole. So the other night, uh, they had a party over at the Oregon Heritage Council prior to the car and boat show, and they gave us a, a plaque, which I promptly forgot to bring tonight, but I will bring. <laughs> You can um, hang it up on your wall. But you know, <laughs> it, it was really good to see because they weren't the usual suspects that come to these meetings. They were just other uh, citizens, and they were happy and very excited about the next day. So it was a it was a nice feeling. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, any reports from officers? Do I have to have one? You told me I could talk for forty five minutes. No. <laughs> I have a report. No. <laughs> I'm short. No, no report. All right. In that case, then, we're going to recess City Council, and we'll call the uh, Nora meeting to order. Can you call the roll? Could do that. Chair Studebaker. Here. Member Kohoff. Here. Mans. Here. O'Neill. Here. Lamont. Here. Wynn. Here. And yes, I'm here. Okay, we have... First item of business is a resolution, law resolution 1904, authorizing the executive director to sign an agreement terminating the, the agreement we had from January 16, 28, with Sturgeon Development Partners. I move to adopt law resolution 1904. Second. 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 Any oh. discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, we have uh, meeting minutes of June 4th, 2019, June 18th, 2019, and June 16th, 2019. Move to approve. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, that being the case, the Laura meeting is adjourned. We'll now go into, uh, we're convening city council, we'll go into executive session. And this ends the televised portion of our meeting. Thank you. The Lake City Council will now meet in executive session pursuant to RS 192.660 subsection 2D to conduct deliberations with persons that are designated to carry on labor negotiations. Designated staff will be allowed to attend the executive session. Per state law, representatives of the news media are not invited to join this particular executive session. Uh, no final decision will be made in the executive session, and at the end of the executive session, the city council will return to an open session and will welcome any audience who may be waiting back into the room.